Welcome to the next session uh, where we are commemorating and analyzing and pondering and uh, thinking about urgent questions today as part of Global Justice Day, and uh, which is of course sponsored by the Center for Civic Engagement, the Institute for Peace Studies, um, lots, of, lots of wonderful partners, of course, the Cultural Center, as well as, uh, most importantly, Honors College and the School of Communication. We are so delighted that all of you are here, even though we're talking painful issues, difficult topics. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Linda Longmire. I'm a professor in Global Studies and Geography Department, and also um, a, a grateful member of the Center for Civic Engagement, Institute for Policy Studies, and the Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives. Before we begin today with this really important next discussion about the role of the media and reframing this current crisis, um, current and ongoing crisis uh, in the Middle East. I um, want to make a couple of announcements about other events coming up. We have an extremely vital, energized, and um, critical thinking campus. So I want to tell you about a couple other things and invite you to those as we think about what might peace look like. One big issue is, of course, immigration. And today at 1 o'clock, after this session, there will be a forum right here uh, on immigration. The Immigration Crisis Causes Impacts and Responses that's sponsored by Hofstra Labor Studies as in the Center for Labor and Democracy. So please stay for that. It's a whole day. This is almost like a day of dialogue where we have things going on all day. Very important. The other thing to, that I want you to know about and to invite you to attend is the next in the International Scene Lecture Series, where we will have Peter Beinart, who's been here on campus before and shared a lot of insight, not only about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is, of course, what he'll focus on uh, in this talk, the uh, upcoming talk, but um, uh, he has also talked about other foreign policy crises and issues. Very, um, very interesting, important to see. So he's talking about crisis in Gaza, of course, uh, and a perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's March 28th, but in the 2.40 to 4.05 time slot. So please come to that. Again, almost all these events are happening in this space. So uh, March 28th. There's flyers in the back about all of these things. Also, um, you know, I don't think anyone doesn't know that study abroad is probably one of the most important ways, particularly for us as Americans, to learn about what's going on in the world. And so just a reminder about two study abroad programs that are kind of part of our peace initiatives. One is the upcoming one in Northern Ireland, um, in Derry, Northern Ireland, which is a path to peace in Northern Ireland. I've got room to squeeze one more person in. It's May 19th to June 10th. And then this wonderful program um, in Cuba, which will be held in January, January 3rd through the 17th. And, um, and one of our speakers today, our wonderful colleague, Mario Murillo, has information about that if you want to participate. Again, highly encouraged. Travel expands the horizons and hopefully creates empathy, understanding, and creative thinking. Um, also wanted to mention um, the uh, Peace Studies minor, as well as we have a, civ a civic um, uh, engagement minor as well. And the Intro to Peace and Conflict Studies class is going to be in the fall, so encourage students who are still looking for classes um, to think about that Tuesday, Thursday from 1 to 2.25. All these initiatives are so very important. In, as we grapple with, as as a community, as, as well as as global citizens, as we grapple with these very urgent questions um, that affect us not only afar in the world, but, but certainly right here at home as well. And one of the most important ways of understanding that is, of course, thinking about the various narratives, trying to do some deep listening to the narratives of the other. Um, and that's, again, as difficult, as painful as some of these topics are, that's what we need to do, all of us, to bring both respect, compassion, and also critical thinking to our reflections on all of these issues and these narratives. And again, because the media framing of all of this is so absolutely urgent in sorting things out, we are especially grateful for this panel 
and um, this conversation. And we will open things up to your questions and comments. Again, always done respectfully. And uh, again, with, with the, the kind of deep listening that is so important. I think I've always mentioned you know, in these sessions, one of my favorite quotes is by Antonio Gramsci, who says, we have to think pessimistically, but by that he means critically, realistically, but we have to act optimistically. And uh, in that spirit, that's kind of the spirit of the entire day, Global Justice Day. So uh, important to that we that we question, that we have that we have doubts, that we think critically and creatively, but also that we act. Right? That there are ways in which we can express our participation, particularly in a democracy. For the moment, at least, we need to have um, voice. We need to to find voice and to share those perspectives. So we'll get started, and I'm again so, so gr delighted that we're, this conversation will unfold today, and again, we want to have lots of time for your questions and comments. There was a mic in the center, but remember, tuition-paying students get priority, and um, so, um, so after, um, after our guests are speaking, you'll line up and ask your questions. Um, so I want to introduce my dear colleague and dear friend, Mario Maria, who many of you know. Of course, he's a professor in the School of Communication, professor of radio journalism, and what is it? That's the batch of it, I guess. <laughs> Additionally, um, you know, Mario is an amazing uh, colleague. I don't want to embarrass him, but he not only speaks truth to power, he uses his power to speak truth. And has been um, involved as a radio producer, um, you know, award-winning, internationally known, as well as an expert on Colombia. And again, I can't recommend highly enough his Cuba program coming up. But um, but again, he is. Um, we are so fortunate to have him here at Hofstra, uh, and uh, so appreciate all of his many talents. And um, he will be uh, he'll be in conversation with. Amy Goodman, the award-winning journalist, that he will introduce right now. So please join me in not welcoming Professor Murillo, because he dwells here, but, um, but uh, a round of appreciation. Check. This works. I think I know how to use a microphone. Well, thank you, Linda, uh, and thank you, everybody. I have a lot of comments and, and thoughts to kind of present as we Welcome my good friend and, and taught to believe 36 years, no, no Amy Goodman for 36 years. Uh, I was really young, like I was like five years old, I think, when we met. Um, but uh, first I want to thank so many people, and I know this is kind of, uh, you know, a little bit redundant, but the CCE, the Center for Civic Engagement, what well, one uh, uh, organizer that we invited to campus years ago referred to Center for Community Activism, Grassroots Organizing and Consciousness Raising is really what CCE is. And uh, I want to thank uh, Phil Dalton, the executive director, all the graduate assistants who work with him and all the fellows who are here. It's a great organization. I'm really proud to be a part of it here in Hofstra. Of course, the Hofstra University Cultural Center, a team of three and maybe a couple more, but generally three, in including Athleen Collins and Janine Rinaldi and Carol Mallison, who put these kinds of events on as if it was nothing. But it's not. It's a lot of work. I mean, just doing this one session was a stress for me, and I can imagine what it is for, for them. So thank you all, always. Um, the uh, Honors College here at Hofstra University um, helped us to bring Amy Goodman to campus. I don't know if Dean Fresina or Tamika Robinson are here, but we always salute them for the work that they do uh, here on campus. And of course, my colleagues at the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication and, and Journalism and in the Radio, Television, Film Department. And of course, the uh, uh, Institute for Peace Studies, which a number of us are part of, um, and the Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives, trying to bring the, the discussions about peace and justice right here onto our campus. So I just want to thank all of those. Um, I know it's been really difficult these last five months, and obviously nothing compared to what the people in Gaza are facing right now and, and the suffering that's going on on a daily basis. But it's been difficult for just about all of us, and many of you, I know personally, with family and, and with colleagues from the start, October 7th, of course, the, the, the murder of 1,200 plus, uh, mostly civilians in Israel. Um, uh, painful for a lot. I've talked to students who I know that was really painful for, for many. 
um, the kidnappings, of course, and, and, and many of whom are still being held uh, without really being accounted for. And then also the immediate, almost immediate response, brutal response that we've seen really unfold for the last five months. Devastating, devastating. And you know, I was going to talk a little bit about my personal connection to the Palestine-Israel conflict, having reported from there from my very first international reporting gig, literally almost at the age of some of you who are graduating right now. I was 22 years old, recently graduated from NYU, and I went there and I spent six weeks right after the, actually six months into the, what they call the first intifada, and spending time all over Israel and Palestine, and that really moved me and shaped me in many ways to what I've done for the last 35, 36 years of my professional academic uh, activist career, uh, those experiences right there on the ground. But I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but it definitely, we know that this conflict has been going on for 100 years plus. Um, but we don't, I don't think, and despite the cycle of violence that we've seen up and down over these last, certainly these last 60 years, I don't think we've seen what we're seeing right now. And I've been following it carefully for a long time. I don't think we've seen the level of, of suffering that we're seeing right now. Um, and, it, and, and I know for many of you it hurts and it's really difficult to talk about. Um, and that's why I really appreciate the folks here at Hofstra because, um, you know, there's been upheavals and conflict in campuses, and we're hearing all you know pre university presidents stepping down and being fired, et cetera. And here, despite the passions, despite the concerns, despite the uncertainties, we've more or less been able to navigate through this with civility, with respect, with decency. There have been hiccups, no doubt, we know, right? We definitely know. And there's been some missteps. But for the most part, it's been with respect, it's been with dignity, it's been with clarity, and I have so many people to thank. The folks from the Office of Equity Inclusion, um, all the people I mentioned before, the folks from the Anthropology Department, folks from the Religion Department, um, the, the clerical leaders, the religious leaders on campus who tried to lead and, 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 and bring people together to talk about some of these issues. And so that's in this spirit that we're here today to talk about um, what's going on right now. And I, from my background and my connection with journalism and with media, I thought it would be useful to try to understand at least one perspective, because when we talk about journalism, we talk about a, there's many different kinds of journalism, as we know, right? But the kind of journalism that I've gravitated towards in my career and that our special guest has been carrying out for decades um, is a kind of journalism that tries to put face on those voices that perhaps we don't hear too much about on CNN, on Fox News, on WCBS News Radio, et cetera, right? And I, and I pointed it out to her yesterday, to Amy, when we were talking on the phone and she was threatening not to come. Um, uh, uh, I told her, you probably don't remember, but the first time I met you, before I started working at WBAI back in May of 1989, I had met Amy, I was a senior at NYU, journalism political science major, and I went to the National Federation of Community Broadcasters meeting in Washington, D.C., and Amy, I met her there. We talked for a while, and then I heard her speak. And she made a comment that really resonated with me and that I still tell to my students today, that as a journalist, our responsibility is to go where the cameras and where the microphones aren't, to go where the silence is, because that's where the stories are really shaping people. That's where lives are being molded, we're being affected, et cetera. In other words, and I don't like this term, voice for the voiceless, because everybody's struggling and fighting to have their voice heard, and I don't think I need to give the voice to the, voice to the voiceless, and I think Amy probably feels the same way, but this idea of telling stories that are not being shared, telling stories that people are not necessarily hearing, that's what I want to do, and I hope some of those of you who, I know there's some journalism students here, I hope that might have a little bit of a, resonance with you as you move forward in your careers uh, here. So with that said, let me shut up, or try to shut up, because I still have to introduce Amy. And uh, needless to say, the introduction is long. So, um, and, and that's what we're going to talk about, the work that, she, that, that she's been doing as a journalist. Um, 
So let's, let's, I have this, I'm going to read this straight through. Amy Goodman is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now! How many of you watch Democracy Now! and know about Democracy Now! Watch or listen? I listen. I never watch it. I always listen because um, I like radio. That's, that's my background. Um, Democracy Now! is a national daily independent award-winning news program airing on over 1,400 public television and radio stations worldwide. The Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University honored Goodman with the 2014 IF Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence Lifetime Achievement Award. She's also the first journalist to receive the Right Livelihood Award. I'm not sure if you know what the Right Livelihood Award is, but it's sort of the alternative Nobel Prize for developing an innovative model of truly independent grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people the voices that are often excluded by the mainstream media. She is the first co-recipient of the Park Center for Independent Media's Izzy Award, named for the great muckraking journalist I.F. Stone, and was later selected for induction into the Park Center's I.F. Stone Hall of Fame. Goodman has co-authored a number of books, uh, several New York Times bestsellers, including Democracy Now!, 20 years covering the movement's Changing America, The Silenced Majority, Stories of Uprisings, Occupations, Resistance, and Hope, and Breaking the Sound Barrier, uh, the last two written with Dennis Moynihan. Uh, she's received the Society for Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chi Award for Excellence, the American Women in Radio and Television Gracie Award, the Paley Center for Media's She Made It Award, and her reporting on East Timor. Some of you are probably familiar with it. It was groundbreaking and in many ways changed the world changed East Timor, changed the trajectory of those politics on a national and a global scale, as well as Nigeria, has won numerous awards, including the George Polk Award, the Robert F. Kennedy Prize for International Reporting, and the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Award. Those of you journalism students, those are the kinds of awards you'd like to get down the road. Um, Time Magazine named Democracy Now! its pick of the podcasts, along with NBC's Meet the Press. Pulse named Goodman one of the 20 top global media figures of 2009, and then the list goes on in terms of other accolades and awards. I knew her and had the pleasure of working with her when I arrived at WBAI many years ago. She was the news director of WBAI Pacific Radio at the time, and we co-hosted for a while the morning show on Fridays, and that was some of the funnest times I had on the radio. So Amy, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Join us. Cool. We have like, what, five minutes, 10 minutes? Um, anyway, so uh, we obviously we're, the idea is we're, we're going to talk a little bit about Gaza and the coverage, media coverage of Gaza. But I thought for the interest of getting to know Amy, for those of you who are not familiar with Amy Goodman's work, uh, maybe to get into a little bit about your work as a journalist. You know, first of all, what got you into this crazy craft of telling stories? Uh, and, and, and being a journalist, and, and particularly the approach that you have taken for so many years. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation. Um, um, uh, maybe it's a thank you. Or maybe we'll just use your mic and switch it off. Yeah. Okay. I feel like it's back to Friday. Check. Right? often shared mics. Um, um, it's an honor to be with you again, Mario. Mario is a great journalist, not to mention, I am sure, professor. And to be here at Hofstra and to come home to Long Island, because I grew up in Bayshore. I went to Bayshore High School. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my dad was a local ophthalmologist and uh, was with Physicians for Social Responsibility. And you might, the older ones here, remember these posters in the Long Island Railroad that said, your doctor is worried. And it was a doctor in a white coat with a stethoscope. And in the stethoscope um, uh, circle, it had a nuclear cloud. And Physicians for Social Responsibility deeply concerned about nuclear war. Um, he did this photo shoot for it. He said the hardest thing as he was in his white coat was not smiling. Um, he looked exactly like Peter Sellers. My mom taught um, in uh, local colleges, I think here as well as other places, uh, women's history and literature, and she founded the first um, uh, Sane Freeze chapter on Long Island. 
Uh, so it's just wonderful to come back and to be with all of you. Um, ta talking about journalism, going back to the beginning, I started uh, listening to WBAI in New York, 99.5 FM, decades ago. And WBAI is a part of the Pacifica Radio Network in the United States, which was founded in 1949 by <clears throat> Lou Hill, a war resistor, who came out of the detention camps and said, there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was founded. Not run by corporations as George Gervner, the late dean at the Annenberg School of the University of Pennsylvania would say. Not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. So the first station was KPFA, 49. 59, as I know is before all you were born, KPFK in Los Angeles. 1960, WBAI was founded. 1977, Jazz and Justice Radio in Washington, D.C., WPFW. 1970, Houston, Texas, KPFT went on the air. It's the only radio station in the country a few weeks after it went on the air. The Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Um, they got back on their feet. They rebuilt the transmitter. A few weeks later, they were broadcasting until the Klan strapped 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter. And as Orlo Guthrie was singing Alice's Restaurant, they blew it up again. I mean, I thought our Alice's Restaurant was a great song, but we all have different musical tastes. Anyway, a few months later, um, KPF rebuilt the transmitter again. The national media came to Houston, Texas, and the five Pacific stations were broadcasting. I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops. I often confuse their titles. But he said blowing up KPFT was his proudest act. Why? I think because he understood how dangerous it is to hear a young person in Iraq an uncle in Afghanistan, a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, um, speaking from their own experience. Now, you might say, that uncle, uh, I, he reminds me of my uncle, and I can't stand him. Well, that's not the point. The point is it makes you much less likely to want to destroy um, what you're hearing, because at least you can understand where they're coming from. That understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on Earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war. And that's why we have to take the media back. We need a media that's not run by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war and peace. That's not run by the oil companies when we cover the climate catastrophe. That's run, not run by the financial institutions, the banks, when we cover inequality. But that's run by the listeners, the readers, the viewers, who want to get an authentic view of what's happening in the world. So Pacifica started years ago. And in 1996, Democracy Now! came out of that network. And we were the first, the only daily grassroots global election show that year on, in public broadcasting. We're only on radio. It was the second election, I think, of President Clinton. And we were only going to go until the election, uh, just for that year, and then pack up and go back to WBAI. But the response to going from state to state in this country following the primaries, but seeing what people were doing on the ground, not just broadcasting those typical pundits who know so little about so much explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. We were really seeing what people were doing on the ground. Um, and you know, I actually at the time, and I think it's very relevant today, 
was in Haiti when Pacifica called me and asked me to host this new program, Democracy Now! I was in Haiti at an underground safe house. When someone would announce they wanted to run for office, they could be gunned down. When people went to the polls, they could be killed. And yet the overwhelming number of people in Haiti voted. And I said, oh, and I'm going to do an election show in the United States when most people at that time, most people did not vote. But I didn't think it was apathy. I thought maybe people don't feel like there are people to vote for that represent them. Or they're involved in other things. And I wanted to know, what are people doing at the grassroots level? And that's how um, Democracy Now! was born. So the day after the election, when we said, OK, we're packing up, all the stations said, wait, we want Democracy Now! to continue. And so from 1996 to 2001, the week of the terror attacks at the World Trade Center and uh, in Washington, we were broadcasting on radio from a community media center, downtown community television, an old firehouse blocks from ground zero. We were the closest national broadcast to ground zero on September 11th. And that was when Democracy Now! went on television. We went first on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, public access in New York. Then stations around the country, TV stations, started to say, we want to broadcast you as emergency broadcasting. The time we'd send out those large video cassettes, the FedEx guys, the post office guys would come, and it was like Santa Claus. They'd, soon they would have these huge bags of these video cassettes that we were sending around the country. I thought they had to get there the next day because it was breaking news. It shouldn't be snail mail. And then we started broadcasting on satellite. So we went from nine community radio stations in 1996 to over 1,500 public television and radio stations uh, in this country and around the world with our headlines and segments also translated into Spanish. And a station a week picks up Democracy Now! And I think it's because of the authentic voices that people hear. Not those typical pundits, young people, older people, uh, people of every religion, ethnicity. Um, and you start to demand that of the rest of the media. Like, how come we don't hear those voices elsewhere? Because I really do think that the people we broadcast on Democracy Now!, which will bring us to um, <clears throat> you know, covering the whole conflict in Gaza right now, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take the media back. So before we get into some examples from recent coverage, maybe give us a couple of examples of the work. I mean, not, not, to, not talking about Gaza in particular, but some of the coverage of all the other conflicts yeah. and, and how that led to a, a, this burgeoning audience that you've been talking well, about. Well, I mentioned I was in Haiti. I mean, do you all, are you following what's happening in Haiti right now? I just came from New York where we broadcast Democracy Now! this morning, 8 to 9, and our top story was Haiti because yesterday the unelected prime minister, Ariel Henry, announced he will not continue as prime minister. He can't even get back into his country. Uh, he's in Puerto Rico right now. He's trying to get back to Haiti. The whole country has risen up um, uh, saying they want uh, an elected government. Uh, it is a true crisis that's unfolding in Haiti. <clears throat> Yesterday, Tony Blinken and the Caribbean leaders met in Jamaica, um, and he promised something like $100 million for a multinational force to go into Haiti's so-called peacekeeping force. But the problem for Haiti that people there across the political spectrum feel is that they have been used by countries like the United States, like France, do you know it was the first country born of a slave uprising in 1804? It would take decades for the United States to recognize this republic. Why did they refuse for so long? Because they were afraid enslaved people in the United States would rise up 
following the example of those enslaved in Haiti. That just gives you a little bit of a taste of, um, of what the US role has been there. Then in the early 20th century, the US occupied Haiti, um, used it as a place uh, more recently for um, cheap labor. And um, in 1990, the first democratically elected leader, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, um, uh, finally overthrowing the Duvalier regime, Ma Papa Doc and Baby Doc, who were pillaging the country. And Aristide came to power. And in 1994, the US uh, helped lead a coup against him. And the person who has been unelected, that the people have been demanding step aside for a long time, for a few years after the previous um, leader was assassinated, um, the U.S. continued to support until now, and it's clear the reason Ariel Henry is saying that he is stepping down is the U.S. sees what a catastrophe Haiti is right now, and that it's untenable to continue to support him. And I just want to say right nearby in Honduras, we just covered, almost no one else covered it, the federal trial of the former president of Honduras. His name is Joe, J-O-H, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who was just tried for several weeks in New York for turning his country into a narco state. He came out of a coup that was supported by the United States in Honduras so overthrowing the democratically elected leader. Mm -hmm. And now he and his brother, his brother is serving life in prison in the United States for drug trafficking, and now Juan Orlando Hernandez, who so repressed the people of Honduras, um, and they were saying this is not a tenable leader, now, even though he was supported by Republican and Democratic leaders in the United States, um, the Southern District of New York went after him, and he could be sentenced to the rest of his life in prison. These are not uh, very, um, these are very serious examples of absolutely catastrophic US intervention in our hemisphere. All right, so with that in mind, how have you, given that, that long trajectory, uh, how have, have you and the team at Democracy Now! approached the devastating crisis that we're seeing unfold for the last five months in Gaza? Devastating is not the word. Um, it is so horrific what is taking place. And we go to the voices that are not often heard, but should be heard everywhere. Um, you know, there were hundreds of hostages taken on October 7th. And so, we talked to hostage families. I thought for a minute maybe we could go to uh, Noy Katzman. Noy's brother Chaim, uh, he was a graduate student at the University of Washington. Um, and he never taught before, but the local synagogue asked if he would teach Hebrew while he was there. And so he was beloved at the synagogue there. He goes home to Israel. Um, he was on the kibbutz. Um, and he was hiding in a closet, protected the people in the closet, and he was killed. Um, his sibling, Noy, um, we spoke to in Brussels. And this we have found over and over. Um, speaking to um, other hostage family members, people have been Hostage families have been protested, protesting outside Israeli military intelligence in Tel Aviv. Many have been calling for the ouster of Netanyahu, saying, you don't care about our hostage families. You care about devastating Gaza. That's not going to save our family members. In fact, they have said over and over, that will surely get them killed. Um, so. I can't remember the date on this, so maybe it'll show it. Oh. I think, yeah, this is uh, October 23rd, the, oh. the interview that you had here, and the, this is the title, Not In My Brother's Name, correct? That's all. Not In My oh. Brother's Name. So, uh, sorry, we have some technical issues. Could you see it? Uh, it's, it's black and white, but you can get the substance of it here. My call to my government, stop killing people. 
That's the message Noy Katzman recently gave during a eulogy for their brother Chaim Katzman, an Israeli peace activist who was killed during the Hamas attack October 7th that killed 1,400 people. Israel now says 222 hostages are still being held in Gaza after two were released Friday. Chaim Katzman was an academic, a peace activist, a tender of fruit trees in the Cholit Kibbutz, about a mile from Gaza. He was credited with saving the lives of three of his neighbors on October 7th. We spoke to his Seattle, Washington rabbi uh, just last week because Chaim was a graduate student at the University of Washington. We're joined now by Noy, Noy Katzman, who gave the eulogy for their brother. Noy, thank you so much for being with us from Vienna. Um, our deepest condolences to you and your family. Uh, if you can talk about Chaim, Chaim's life, and now what's being done in his name and your thoughts on what should happen right now. I think the death toll, 1,400 Israelis from October 7th, that time, and now uh, more than 5,000 Palestinians, and the number increases even as this show uh, airs. Um, you hear me? We hear you perfectly. Okay, so first of all, um, my father, my brother was, um, um, so he did many things. He was also a car mechanic. He was a DJ. He was an academic, brilliant academic. He also uh, was a gardener. He was in charge also, also of the fruit trees and also of the gardens. Lately, he, he became in charge of the gardens in uh, Cholit. And all of the things he did, he used uh, for for peace. Um, he was a DJ, so he was a DJ of. Uh, he did played almost entirely Arabic music uh, for the middle from the Middle East, about Palestine, and Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt. Uh, he was a gardener, and he uh, volunteered in Rahat, in the garden. Um, in uh, Rahat is a Bedouin city in south of Israel near Be'er Sheva. Um, and he also, uh, he was, uh, he was a volunteer in Misafar Yata, where uh, Palestinians are suffering from, uh, from displacement and uh, terror from uh, Israel, from uh, settlers and soldiers. So he would go there and help them, protect them, and uh, use his knowledge of the car mechanic to, to fix the 4x4 four four, uh, car of the volunteers. Um, and as an academic, he, he, his research was about right wing, and, uh, right wing in Israel and the dangers of right wing in Israel, extreme right wing. Um, like, um, you see, this was in Rabbi Ginsburg, and then his doctorate he wrote about um, religious uh, Zionism, where it's my family that we came from. Noi. Um... Can you talk about what Israel is doing now? Um, the constant bombardment of the Gaza Strip, forcing the dislocation of half the population, and what looks like an imminent ground invasion as a response to the brutality of Hamas on October 7th. Your thoughts and what you think your brother would have felt. Um, okay, so I think the most thing that is bothering me is the lack of responsibility that uh, governments in Israel are taking for many, many years. Um, we can start it from 67 when Israel conquered Gaza Strip and of course didn't give the citizens any citizenship or any rights. Um, it was just a thought that, you know, Palestinians don't need rights. I mean, they don't need basic rights. They'll, they'll be happy to be under our control. Um, and sadly, um, not, don't know if sadly, but in 1987, so the uprising of the first Intifada, of course, proved that to be wrong, <sighs> because uh, pe Palestinians are also people, <laughs> just like Jews and Israelis, and they want the same things like pe people, human beings want. 
Um, sadly, I don't think um, Israel is taking responsibility of anything. I mean, in 2005, we got out of Gaza and we're like, okay, I mean, we just throw it like, like we were never connected to it. And like, okay, let's just let them, like no long process um, agreement, sustainable agreement. And sadly, um, after that, the, in the 10, 15 years, Israel is doing everything to strengthen Hamas and Gaza, just because it doesn't want um, a two-state solution. So it wants to divide between the Fatah and the Hamas. So um, this, of course, failed, because also the Hamas is very terrible to the, to the people in Gaza, ex, uh, especially LGBTs and women, which always suffer from right-wing religious um, government. And at the end, it, of course, came to us because we can put Gaza behind fences or whatever, but then the right-wing extremists of Hamas killed Israelis uh, indiscriminately, uh, civilians, and also my, my left, my left uh, brother, who, of course, it, it very makes sense, you know, that right-wing kill right-wing, uh, left-wing people because they just don't care. They, they earn from the hate. They earn from the death. No, no, we some, just some have the, a, no, yeah. we just have about 30 seconds. And I wanted to ask you to tell us your message to the world today. Um, OK, so. What Israel is doing now is very uh, clearly not in the it's not for the security of anyone, not the people in Israel, not the people of Gaza. Um, some people say, oh, it's um, Israel's, um, it's, it's for the good of Gaza people because we're going to destroy Hamas. Um, if it's not the case, so I think Israel should make sure all the citizens of Israel, of Gaza, should have a safe place to be and maybe kill Hamas. But I don't think it's the, re the real reason. The real reason is just revenge and killing and destruction of the failure of Israel to protect its citizens. Noy Katzman. That was his view. We also talked to the family of Vivian Silver, who was killed on October 7th. They thought she was a hostage. She was 74 years old, a woman who spent decades fighting for a solution in Israel that would end the occupation. That was her main goal. Vivian Silver said, we're organizing women from all over the country, from every side of the political spectrum, saying enough. We're no longer willing to do this. We must reach a political agreement. Um, she was with Women Wage Peace, B'Tselem, uh, Arab Jewish Center for Equality, Empowerment, and Cooperation, which she founded. These are the voices, um, her colleagues, that you didn't hear after, but represented these family members. Now, you see, we were talking about 5,000 Palestinians dead. We're now at over 31,000 Palestinians dead. I wanted to turn to a Virginia cardiologist who speaks from the heart, Dr. Tadic, uh, about what's happened to his family now. I had COVID a few weeks ago, and so my colleague, Nermin Sheikh, uh, talked to him, uh, talking about what's happening in Gaza. <clears throat> and in his case, uh, Tony Blinken invited him to a round table. And like a number of people in the Arab American community, he refused. And he wrote a letter to Blinken saying why. It's similar to what's happening in states like Michigan. These are battleground states that matter enormously to President Biden. But people voting uncommitted because they say they cannot support genocide. This is from Michigan to Alaska, where 29% of the Democrats in the primary voted uncommitted. This is Dr. Tadic. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Nermeen Sheikh. 
Before U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken left for his fifth Middle East trip since October 7th, he held a roundtable meeting Thursday to discuss the situation in Gaza with a number of Palestinian Americans. But some of them refused to attend in protest against the Biden administration's ongoing support for Israel's assault on Gaza. We're joined now by one of those who refused. Dr. Tariq Haddad is a cardiologist and member of the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights who grew up in Gaza. He laid out his reasoning in a 12-page letter to Blinken. Included in Dr. Haddad's letter were pictures of his family members. One of Blinken's staff reportedly made sure to print the letter in color. Dr. Tariq Haddad joins us now from Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, Dr. Tariq Haddad, welcome to Democracy Now! Our condolences to you for uh, the many family members of yours who have been killed in Gaza. Condolences to you for uh, the many family members of yours who have been killed in Gaza. If you could begin by, by talking about what you know of what happened uh, in Gaza to your family members, and then explain this uh, invitation that you received for a meeting with Secretary of State Antony Blinken and why you declined to attend. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me and appreciate the condolences. Um, yeah, I, I think some context is necessary here to understand why I turned this invitation down. So um, I have hundreds of family members in Gaza, both sides of my family, both in the town of Khan Yunus and the, and the Gaza city. Um, I've had about 100 family members at this point who have been killed, um, including physicians, pharmacists, lawyers, engineers, dozens and dozens of children, uh, multiple uh, small babies. Um, I, I can't tell all their stories, but I just want to tell a few um, just for the for the audience. Um, uh, October 25th, um, uh, 10 members of my family, all th three generations of one side of my family uh, were all killed. My cousin Jamad al-Farra, his son, who is a physician, Dr. Tawfiq al-Farra, his wife, who was pregnant, uh, two of their beautiful daughters, Reem and Hala, uh, Jamad's brother, Assam, his wife, Samad, their daughters, Rusul Tukha and Nadian. Um, all multiple generations all killed in one Israeli missile strike. Uh, Tukha, uh, one of the uh, the younger uh, 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 um, women in the family, her wedding day was the day she was killed. Um, they were all from modest means. They actually built the three brothers built the, their home themselves. Ironically, the same home that the Israeli strikes uh, destroyed. Another day, a couple days later. Uh, my cousins Hatim and Aziz and Farra from Khanunis, who lived literally 20 yards from where I grew up, um, were killed along with 14 other members of their family, uh, seven of their children. Aziz was actually a pharmacist, uh, and Hatim was a, just an incredible community figure who always had a smile on his face, always uh, was available to help anybody who needed it. Um, the day before he was killed, Hatim had just come, why not gone up to my uncle and asked if we could house uh, five families who were made homeless by the Israeli missile strikes in our grandparents' house. Um, one child, um, one child out of that whole three generations survived, Hamza. Uh, he had an amputation, was in the hospital. He woke up to find out his siblings, his parents, his uncles and his aunts, his grandparents all had died. Um, excuse me. Uh, and then he died himself in the next day from the trauma injuries from the Israeli attacks uh, because there was inadequate medical care to keep him alive. A um, couple days after that, November 2nd, my cousins uh, Hani, Huda, and Wafat Haddad, all siblings, uh, were killed in Gaza City, uh, along with my cousin Hani's Croatian wife and my aunt. Uh, Huda and Wafat were teachers. Hani was an interior decorator. Um, and my cousin Hani initially survived with, as a physician, I can tell you, is a fairly minor leg injury, but then he bled to death the next day because he had no access to any functional medical facilities since they had all been bombed and destroyed by the Israeli attacks. Um, Hani's brother Wael survived and then had to witness the horror of seeing his mother buried from the waist up um, in the rubble, uh, dead, and he saw his sister Wafat shredded into pieces. Uh, all this, uh, you know, they were messaging me and telling me. Uh, my other cousin, Nael, who I grew up with and had played with as a kid, uh, literally had to bury all his family members in a makeshift grave because he couldn't even access the cemetery. 
uh, and he's been going 24 hours at a time with no food or water. Um, even those in my family who actually fled what was thought to be dangerous areas to safe areas have been targeted. One of my cousins, Samar al farra uh, died in a refugee camp in Rafah around the time she had completed her doctorate for her PhD. And we were about to congratulate her on that doctorate when she was killed. Um, there are family members who've died from a lack of medical care and inability to access medical care. Uh, uh, one of my cousins, Abdul Rahim al-Farra, died uh, because he was unable to reach a functional hospital after he was injured. Uh, four of my uh, family members got killed in an Israeli bombing of their car while they're ironically trying to go to the Gaza European Hospital for shelter. Uh, and then a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Sabri al farra one of my cousins, died with seven of his sons. And then most recently, just a few days ago, um, a baby in our family, Sabri al farra who's 20 days old, died, froze to death, died from hypothermia um, in the refugee camp uh, that his family was in. And this is after this 20-year-old just froze to death after nine of his siblings and his father were murdered by the Israeli military strikes a few weeks before. Um, the ones, the people in my family who have not been killed, uh, arguably are suffering a fate worse than death. Hundreds of my family are displaced. Not a single one of them uh, has uh, is able to stay in their home. Uh, the, all their homes are either damaged or destroyed. Um, one of my family members had to give birth on the rubble of her home that was destroyed and not would, did not even have clothes to put on her baby. Um, famine is common. Every one of my family members has mentioned it. Um, they have no access to clean water. They've had to recycle water uh, because there's no access to clean water, and they've had dysentery and, and gastrointestinal illnesses. Uh, famine, uh, one of my cousins messages me all the time saying he's gone 24 hours without food. Uh, so to answer your question, um, Knowing all this and knowing what I've gone through week after week, month after month, checking every morning to see who's alive, who's dead, who's suffered, who can we help? And as the dead rose to 100 in my family, to 15,000 children all across Gaza, to 30,000 civilians, as I saw the famine happen, I just kept looking for evidence that our government actually cares about the lives of my family. And I saw none. Um, I kept waiting for a ceasefire that Secretary Blinken had access, has the ability to do, and he refused to do it. I kept waiting for for a United Nations resolution uh, to call for a ceasefire, which the United States continued to veto. I kept waiting for for something, and all I saw was the opposite. I saw uh, I saw our U.S. strategic military, Middle Eastern military reserve being used to replenish the Israeli uh, ammunitions for this genocide. I saw uh, cruelly just a few days ago the withdrawal of funding for the United Nations that was supplying military assistance to these over two million people that are going through famine. Um, so getting back to your original question, I, I sort of, I wrote this letter to Secretary Blinken because I wanted him to see me and see Palestinians as human beings, not as some part of political game or some sort of, some sort of, uh, you know, blame game. I wanted him to see us for who we were as human beings, and I wanted him to put himself in my shoes and ask himself if he saw his family getting killed day after day, month after month, as a direct result of government's policies, government's policies, and he knew that somebody in that government could have done something to prevent those 100 people from dying, the suffering of the remaining hundreds of people. How could you sit in a room, given three minutes to face that person and face them, knowing that that person has been directly responsible for the death of your family and all the suffering that your family has seen, and and do so simply as part of a political grandstanding? Um, and that's why I just ethically could not be there, because actions speak louder than words. Um, That's Dr. Tadek Haddad. Now, what a beautiful man, cardiologist, Falls Church, Virginia. And I think he's like my Uncle David, who was a doctor in Albany. He's like my Uncle Howard, who was a doctor in Syosset. Um, 
He's like my grandfather, an Orthodox rabbi, Benjamin Bach, who is the principal of the Crown Heights Yeshiva in Brooklyn. This is the power of media that lets you relate to people because you hear them tell their own story. I grew up going to Hebrew school many times a week. I was very taken during the Holocaust, very connected during the Holocaust because we lost members of our family in the Holocaust by the stories I read of the righteous. That's people who weren't Jewish, but who saved Jews throughout Europe, who took in little kids, who put moms in their barns, who jeopardized their own families because they knew this was wrong. And I think the media can bring people together, can be a bridge. We often focus at Democracy Now! on climate, on the climate catastrophe. You might wonder how this relates. So we were in Dubai just in December for the UN Climate Summit. And um, we got word that a professor that we interviewed in Gaza had just been killed. Let's go to that segment. This is um, the story of Rafat al -Arir. Um This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Dubai in the United Arab Emirates at the UN Climate Summit. Israel's bombardment of Gaza has entered its third month. Health officials in Gaza say the Israeli assault has killed over 17,000 Palestinians. Earlier this week, an Israeli airstrike in Gaza City killed the acclaimed Palestinian academic and activist Rafat al -Adir. Along with his brother, his sister, and four of his nieces. For more than 16 years, al worked as a professor of English literature at the Islamic University of Gaza, where he taught Shakespeare and other subjects. Rafat el was a father of six and a mentor to many young Palestinian writers and journalists. He also co-founded the organization We Are Not Numbers. He authored dozens of stories and poems about life under Israeli occupation in Gaza. In a few minutes, we'll speak to one of his friends. But first, I want to return to Rafat al in his own words. He's spoken to us several times. This is October 10th, as he spoke to Democracy Now!, Israeli strikes rattled his family's home in Gaza City. What is happening in Gaza is complete and utter extermination of the non-Jewish population in occupied uh, Palestine. As you mentioned, Israel ordered a medieval hermetic siege uh, from air and sea. Israel has also just bombed the only way out through Egypt, the Rafah, the Rafah crossing. The only way out is uh, for uh, what's happening, what we are uh, foreseeing is uh, slow starvation, slow genocide. Maybe Israel is going to push us all into the sea. And I think what is making it even more difficult than before is that the whole world, not even lip service, all uh, uh, American and European uh, countries and politicians are rushing to pledge allegiance to Israel and to Netanyahu. Israeli, uh, American uh, politicians, uh, American uh, presidential hopefuls are literally calling for, for, uh, for genocide. American mainstream media is not pushing uh, back against Israeli officials, calling for the collateral damage of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians uh, in Gaza. Uh, uh, why is this happening? Because we refuse to live under occupation. We refuse to live in, 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 in total submission. We want freedom. We want this occupation to end. This is, this is not a state of war, as uh, one of your guests just mentioned. This is a state of occupation that started over uh, seven, uh, 75 years, that started with the, uh, uh, the, the British uh, Empire giving Palestine to the Zionist uh, movement in, in 1917. The only hope we have is in the growing popular support in, in America, in the movements that, uh, of oh, the, 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 the movements, the, the, the human rights and the rights movements in, in, in America and across Europe uh, to, to take to the streets 
uh, to pressure their uh, politicians into uh, uh, putting an end uh, to this uh, uh, dark, dark uh, episode of not only uh, the history of the Middle East, but also the history of, of humanity. If people are asking how uh, was the Holocaust allowed and other genocides in Africa and across the world, now you can see this live on TV, live on social media. Palestinians, whole blocks destroyed, hospitals, schools, uh, businesses. We, we are speaking about uh, uh, thousands and thousands of, of housing units uh, destroyed by, uh, by by Israel. So my message to the free people of the world is to move to pressure, to mobilize, and to take to the streets. Rafat al you are the... Rafat al that was Rafat al in October, speaking to us on Democracy Now! I want to go now to Brian Cox, the star of Succession, reading Rafat's poem, After He Died, If I Die. If I Must Die by Rifat Alaria, November the 1st, 2023. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tale. If I Must Die, written by Rafat al who was killed in early December, bombed by the Israeli military. Um, two other clips. You may have heard about young people like you in Thanksgiving, everyone goes home for break. And these were three Palestinian, Palestinian-American best friends. They grew up in Ramallah, went to the Ramallah Quaker School, I think. And then one of them, Hisham, went to Brown. Another went to Haverford. And the third went to Trinity. But they got back together at Thanksgiving to be together at Hisham's house, grandma's house in Burlington, Vermont. This is after what happened, where we talked to the Haverford student and we talked to a granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor. democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We look now at student protests calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. In one of many actions nationwide, 41 students at Brown University were arrested Monday at a sit-in demanding the school divest its endowment from weapons manufacturers like Raytheon and United Technologies. The school charged the students with willful trespass within school buildings. Meanwhile, students at Haverford College just ended a peaceful week-long sit-in yesterday of the school's administrative offices. Some 100 Haverford students now face the threat of disciplinary action. One of the students who joined the protest has just returned to campus, Kenan Abdel Hamid is a junior at Haverford who was shot two weeks ago, along with his two friends, by a white man in Burlington, Vermont. All three are of Palestinian descent. Tassin Ahmed was shot in the chest, and Hisham Ortani was paralyzed from the chest down after a bullet lodged in his spinal cord. He is a student at Brown University. 
The three grew up and went to school together in Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. We are joined by Kenan Abdelhamid at Haverford College and by his fellow student, Ellie Barron, a Haverford College junior and organizer with Students for Peace who participated in the sit-in. She's granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Kenan, um, thank you so much for being with us. Um, what you and your two close friends went through. I mean, you grew up in Ramallah, went to the friends' school there, visiting together at Thanksgiving, uh, Hisham's grandmother and uncle. Tell us what happened then, and thank goodness you're able to go back to school, having been shot yourself, but then talk about what you're calling for. Um, why were you just walking what you had just were going to dinner? It, um, at Hashem's family's house? Um, we were originally going to go straight to dinner uh, at Hashem's family house, but before going in, we usually decided to go on a walk. And on the walk back, when we we're going to have that delayed dinner, I guess, yeah, that's when we saw. And what did you see? What happened? Explain what happened to the three of you. Well, he was standing on a porch of a house, and he turned around and saw us immediately ran down the steps of the porch, pulled out a pistol and started shooting. Uh, Tahseen was the first to be wounded, then Hisham, and during that time I was able to uh, run, but it seems to have hit me while I was running. And what is the latest? We talked to Hisham's mother, uh, someone you know well, Elizabeth Price, who had flown in to be uh, with her son. Um, at the time we talked, it looked like he would be paralyzed from the chest down. Do you have any latest information? He's in rehab now. Um, I'm not willing to speak on his condition now. That's uh, him and his family's decision. So talk about you coming back to Haverford and what that's meant and the level of activism. And we see now at Brown, where Hisham went to school, um, where he goes to school, 41 students have been arrested. Talk about what's happening at Haverford. Yes, um, what's happening in Haverford, the student activism has been absolutely astounding and amazing. It's very heartwarming to see a collective body of students stand against uh, a blatant genocide of uh, my people and the humanity in that, as well as I wouldn't like to distinguish it being only students. There are different faculty members here that uh, are, in fact, at least pro-Palestinian when it comes to this case. Um, it's overwhelming to see the humanity. I'm very happy it happened. And uh, hopefully uh, sometime different people with different platforms would call for a ceasefire. I want to bring Ellie Barron into the conversation. You're a Haverford junior, uh, granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor. Talk about what you're demanding at Haverford. You all just finished occupying the admin offices, threatened with arrest yesterday. Is that right? So we occupied uh, Founders Hall, which is the main administrative building. And if we didn't leave by yesterday morning, we were threatened with a dean's panel, which could include expulsion. Um, and we have been calling for a ceasefire uh, for specifically Haverford College President Wendy Raymond to release a public statement in support of a ceasefire. And this has precedent at Haverford College. President John Coleman in 1969 wrote a letter to President Nixon and galvanized the signatures of 79 other college presidents demanding that President Nixon oppose the Vietnam War. So there you have Ellie. Ellie could be you. She's the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor. She could be you. Um, and you have Kinan, who could be any of you. Um, Palestinian, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and they stand together against violence for a positive solution. Whether I cover the occupation of East Timor by Indonesia, or Morocco's occupation of the Sahrawi people, or Israel's occupation of Gaza and the West Bank, um, you hear the voices of the occupied, you hear the voices of those who are part of the state that occupies, but are fighting against this, fighting for a more just world. I think we only have a few minutes, right? Uh, 
one. Let's turn on. Okay. Hi, Ms. Goodman. Thank Hi. you so much for you your time. You can call me Amy. Uh, thank you, Amy, for coming out today <laughs> at Hofstra. Um, I have so many questions to ask you about journalism, about the reporting of democracy now, how it's night and day to corporate America. As a journalism student, my name is Fatima Moen. I'm a graduate student in journalism. I want to take your time. I want to pick your brain and be selfish um, about my own future, about my own career in journalism, because I think um, as someone that's set to graduate in two months, the past few months have been so telling of what I like to achieve and what I like to do. And so my question is simply, um, for my future as someone that wants to also build a bridge, as someone that I think is in a position to create a new table, a new ta uh, you know, just create a new platform, maybe do something very different. It's very scary to take that jump, but I think that's where I'm leaning towards. And so my, my question is simply, um, for the next generation of journalists, for the next people that want to speak up, but also want to represent and be very mindful of, of diversifying a media landscape that really speaks to people as you've done and you've proven that it's possible. What is your advice for someone that um, wants to go there? To pursue your heart, to follow your passion. Don't let anyone say you can't do it. And somehow you're going to find a way. The media landscape is ever changing. You hear about news organizations that are closing, that are laying people off. But that also, there are new media organizations with new platforms, and you can create them yourselves, as we did. And also, I think the power is in bringing together all different platforms. You know, we are on social media, we're on television, we're on radio, we're from the beginning, be, well, this is because we didn't have money, we use the internet. I mean, when the networks were in Iraq covering the occupation, paying Saddam Hussein millions to use the satellite there, we pioneered a way to send video through the internet. Our folks would go into internet cafes and divide a 10 minute video report into a thousand tiny little emails. And it would go through like a screen, your back porch, fly through to New York and come back together in New York. And we would broadcast this and the networks would be saying, like in Tahrir when uh, the thugs brought the satellites down and they couldn't send video reports. They were saying, how is Democracy Now! sending 20, broadcasting 25 minute reports? Because we had pioneered these way, ways to send video through the internet. That's becoming more common today, but by, it's just so important. Media is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. And as the corporate media we have in this country divides people constantly, dehumanizes people, um, simply by not letting them be heard, we've got to build this different kind of media. And you would be an essential part of it because you want to do it. And just a quick follow-up, because I think there are professors here that I think are part of the conversation of, of you know, embedding this traditional way of going about things. Can you please speak to them and how maybe encouraging students to think outside the box? I think for a very long time we've had this tunnel vision about success, and if you can speak to the professors that maybe need to step out of their own comfort zones when teaching that. Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. But, you know, just as young people are leading the way in the streets and taking on the powers that be, maybe it's not up to the OG, the old guard. I think it's up to you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Alicia. I'm a freshman political science student. Um, so um, we have this group here called Student Voices for Palestine. I'm the public relations officer. And so um, many times I like post on our Instagram about like um, for awareness about what's happening in Gaza. And um, uh, like as uh, Mario said, like when he was a student, you said that um, the truth is where the cameras are. <laughs> oh. Oh, where they're not <laughs> cameras or mics. The what idea is, oh, okay. the idea is to go to where the silence yeah. is, where the um, spotlight isn't, and that's often where people are. They're not quiet. It's not quite accurate to say where the silence is, 
They're raucous, they're rowdy, they're speaking, they're organizing, but they're not hitting the corporate media radar screen. Um, so um, as many of like us know that there's like an extreme amount of censorship that's also happening, um, especially with like mass media networks, especially in the United States. Um, I know that a lot of like uh, media networks kind of like twist the language when like especially like biased uh, media networks. How do you believe that censorship um, affects people's? You know, it's interesting how the various channels deal with things. A friend was just showing me um, what happened after the Grand Central protest. A thousand Jews on a Friday night went to Grand Central um, a couple months ago. I hate to say it like this, but how many thousands of Palestinians dead ago? Um, and they went to shut down business as usual, to shut down Grand Central. They were Holocaust survivors themselves, 85-year-old women. They were students in high school and college. They were college professors. And they went to Grand Central. It was a remarkable scene. So I was just looking at how Fox covered it. Um, I think Fox talked about, I'm not sure if they used the term terrorist protest that happened uh, at Grand Central. Um, were they referring to the Holocaust grandma or were they referring to the professor uh, in the CUNY system? Um, of course, I'm being facetious because to say the least, neither of them are that. They're fighting against the violence and they're joining hands with Muslims and Christians and Hindus and others in saying there has to be a political, peaceful, negotiated solution here. Um, now, you have that, and then you have the networks like MSNBC and CNN. Um, I'm not exactly how sure they covered that particular protest, but more often than not, it's with silence. They just simply don't do it. And we need a media that opens up, where that spreads across the globe. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the planet, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace and life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. I think I'm about to do a disservice to democratic discourse because the tyranny of the clock is calling. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. Yes, you. One last question or comment. Forgive me. All right. Thank you for the time. My name's Noah Fields. I'm a television major here at Hofstra. And one thing I want to ask you is how do we deal with a desensitized population where we can go on X or Twitter, Instagram in the morning? watch footage of Palestine getting destroyed and then two minutes later go get our Starbucks. How do we deal, as media professionals, deal with a population that increasingly grows more bloodthirsty, that doesn't, oh, it's only one bombing instead of two. Mm. How do we stop mm. that sort of justification and rationalization we typically have? To support you on Democracy Now! 15 seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and you said your name is Noah? Oh, uh, yeah, Noah. Noah. So I'm going to just go back to the Oscars Sunday night. Um, I don't know how many of you watched it, but the film that won for Best International Film was Zone of Interest. I just watched it right? this weekend. Yeah. And it's about the Holocaust. And it goes to your question, because it's about the commandant who had this idyllic, beautiful house right outside the wall of the uh, concentration camp, Auschwitz, that killed more than a million, incinerated more than a million Jews. He presided over so many of that. But he lived in a beautiful garden wonderland. You never actually go into Auschwitz in this film, but you see the backdrop, uh, you see the chimneys, but you hear it's the soundtrack yes, yeah. of bullet shots, and that's what you're talking about. And how you can live this life, and this is what the director and the producer, we interviewed the producer. The producer, when they won a BAFTA, a British Oscar a few weeks ago, he said, let's take down these walls. Whether we're talking about the Holocaust or Gaza, 
And then Jonathan Glazer, the director, at the Oscars when he won, raised the same issue. Well, we have to be resensitized. And I absolutely think, I hate to put this all on your shoulders, Noah, but I'm going to put it on everyone's shoulders here. It's not only the younger generation. It's older people. It's middle-aged people. It's kids. We have to care. We don't have a choice. And I don't actually think I am imploring you to care that you don't. I think we as human beings naturally care. And never let anyone shame you out of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.